can't. It can't. We need to bless that diversity and discover how those gifts are meant to be used. Please. What does the bishop do for fun? <laughs> <laughs> well, this bishop does for fun. Uh, hiking and backpacking and going flying. Uh, last summer, uh, my husband was doing a, an expansion on a little cabin we have in the mountains of Oregon, and I did a lot of wiring and carpentry. <laughs> <laughs> and I count that great fun. <laughs> when you visit a parish that's, that's annually Catholic, what kind of things do you when I visit a parish that's anti-ordination of women or anti-gay, what's my conversation with them? I don't get invited to many parishes <laughs> that, that are against the ordination of women. Uh, but I do get invited into places where there are people who are uncomfortable with ordaining gay and lesbian people. Uh, that's been the historic attitude in the, Epi in the Episcopal Church. I think it's changing. Uh, I'm happy to be in conversation. I'm happy to tell people why I think it, God uses and needs the gifts of all people. Uh, when somebody asked me that question in 2000 during the election process in Nevada, I said, well, yeah, I think God needs the gifts of blonde people and short people and gay people and every sort of human being. Uh, we're created in a variety of ways. Uh, and those gifts are needed to build the reign of God. Uh, we don't all have to be blonde. Um, we don't all have to be short or tall. Uh, there is a gift that comes from the way in which a person is created. my voice. I feel so honored and bowed to your being here. I come from a parish in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where my clergyman was Murray Kenny, who almost went to jail to get you guys in there way back and you know when. And I'm just thrilled to be here. Thank you. I wouldn't be standing here yeah, well, without okay. the work of people That's like right. that. You went, almost went to jail. And in Philadelphia, yes, a long time ago. We were there for him. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be here without the first round of women who were That's ordained, right. who That's had right. to put up with a whole lot. Right. Um, I didn't have to do that. I had a much harder time as a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. The first year I was in graduate school, women was the first year that they let women go to sea on the ship overnight. <laughs> So, a whole lot has changed in a whole lot of parts of our lives. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Would you tell us, you mentioned the 16 countries the church is in, and that's a recent discovery for me. I always thought they were all national churches, and uh, I didn't realize that how our church is actually these churches. Could you amplify that a little so people can sure. understand how international we really are? I didn't realize that. Sure. Um, the Episcopal Church started in the, the colonies after the revolution, right? This being one of them. Uh, as the United States grew, uh, particularly by the 1820s or 1830s, the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society, which is the formal name of this church, began to send missionaries to other parts of the world. They went to places like Japan and Brazil and Liberia. Uh, they went to places like the Philippines. Uh, they went to Central America. They went to Hawaii, which was a territory, still not a territory at that point. They went to Hawaii because the king and queen asked for missionaries for this church after they sampled different Christian traditions. Uh, later on, Episcopal clergy and lay missionaries began to go to places where the U.S. was establishing what were effectively colonies, uh, like the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. Uh, to, 
Today, other provinces of the Anglican Communion owe their existence to missionaries from this church, but they have become separate provinces. The Philippines, uh, Japan in part, uh, Brazil, Central America, which includes five or six countries in Central America. Uh, Liberia was a diocese of this church until about 30 years ago, and it's now part of West Africa. We still have dioceses in other countries, which include Taiwan. Um, Micronesia includes Guam and Saipan. It's not a diocese, it's an area. Honduras, Ecuador has two dioceses. Colombia, Venezuela, Haiti is our biggest diocese numerically, the Dominican Republic, the British and U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and a group of churches in six countries in Europe who started as ministries to, mostly to embassies and American business interests. But those churches are now pretty well indigenized. They may have services in English, but they also have services in the, in the local language. Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, and Switzerland. And those are the convocation of Episcopal churches in Europe. There is the odd reality that the Church of England has a diocese in Europe, <laughs> called the Diocese of Gibraltar, also for similar kinds of colonial reasons. They overlap. Um, there are churches in the same countries that function in relationship to the Church of England and this church. They're also in full communion with the Lutheran churches in Europe and with the old Catholic churches in Europe. And eventually, I think uh, those bishops of those four different churches hope that they will become national churches, that they will become some other kind of entity so that we don't have this confusing, overlapping circumstance. But there are 100 dioceses in the United States, and there are 12 other bodies in other countries, 15 other countries. Yes? the earthquake had 169 congregations uh, served by 37 clergy, ran 254 schools serving from preschool to uh, college and graduate level. Uh, 100 of those 169 church buildings have been badly damaged or demolished. Many of the schools have been destroyed. All of the cathedral complex in Port-au-Prince has been destroyed. Uh, the trade school, the music school, the school for handicapped children, a hospital in Laogan has been destroyed. Uh, the, do you know about the seminary? Okay, I've had conflicting information about the seminary. Uh, all the clergy survived uh, intact, as far as we know. The bishop's wife was badly injured, is being treated. Bishop's home was destroyed. He has uh, set up a, a camp that's serving 3,000 people on a soccer field next to an elementary school at Port-au-Prince. There are 20 other camps like that around Haiti, <coughs> serving a total of about 25,000 people. The biggest way you can help right now is to send donations to Episcopal Relief and Development. They are working hard at the immediate relief efforts that will go on for a number of months. Uh, the reconstruction will take many years. It's too early in this aftermath to say what that reconstruction needs to look like. Episcopal Relief and Development does not have a mandate to rebuild churches and indeed will not. They may help to rebuild some of the health care facilities. Uh, but the, the rest of the Episcopal Church is going to have to help in that rebuilding effort. So if you're passionate about that, collect your dollars and uh, send them to the diocese for, for preservation until they're needed. One last question. Yes, sir. What can we do to support you? You can be healthy where you are. Build holy 
healed and healthy communities of transformation because that's who we're